We just got back from Singapore last night. So uh, my body doesn't know what time it is. They're 16 hours ahead of us. And uh, so my body's like, right now I'd be sleeping. My body's like, you're supposed to be sleeping. I know. So if I fall asleep in the pulpit, just remember, that's why I'm not a pastor. I'm a prophet, and I get paid to have dreams and visions. <laughs> Quick toast testimony, when we were in Singapore, my son-in-law, who uh, they pastor their church, Marty and Jamie, uh, pastor their church in Fortuna, California, they had a, a young man, I think I, think I have the testimony, I have, this, I have the end of the testimony right for sure, I think it was a young man, uh, his finger, he, he, he didn't have a finger from his, you know, his little baby finger from his knuckle forward, and they prayed for him, and while they prayed for him, the finger, a new finger formed completely, and a fingernail formed on the finger while they watched. <laughs> that awesome? I want to um, talk to you about something that actually I've, I've shared much of this message before, and I'm, I'm going to take it a little bit uh, different place towards the end of the message, but um, I want to talk about how the Holy Spirits are spirit guide and takes us, leads us into all truth. How many know the Holy Spirit is the ultimate spirit guide? And he leads us into all truth. And I want to begin with a dream that I told you about that I had a while back. And in this dream, I saw words going across a, a screen like in a ticker tape, uh, like you would see on Fox News or CNN. Words like powerful, like courage, like godly, like holy, like Jesus. Just words. They were going across the screen on a ticker tape. And and then there, this voice in the dream says, I'm, he said, I'm giving you a new operating system. And when the voice said, I'm giving you a new operating system, the words begin to fall like rain. Now, here's where it gets complicated. All of us have, have experience of, experiences with God that didn't come with words, and then we try to describe them with words. So I want you to understand that I'm trying to communicate something to you. It's not going to be exactly accurate because it didn't, I didn't, it wasn't something God told me. It was an experience I had with God. So uh, I, this, every time I share this dream, it feels like it's not quite adequately communicated because you're not, you're not, you're not, you weren't there. So, but anyway, so the words were going across the screen on this ticker tape, and suddenly I heard this voice in the dream, and the voice said, I'm giving you a new operating system. And when the voice said, I'm giving you a new operating system, words began to fall like rain. And now here's where, here's where it gets hard to explain because I've never seen anything on earth that is like this. So I'm doing the best I can to explain this experience. The words were, uh, were alive. They were kind of like a living PowerPoint. And they were three-dimensional. Three so you could, And some of them were little, like little words. And some of them were, were, were larger, very big. And you could view them from different perspectives, like almost like if you had, you know, if this was a car and you could look at it from the front and from underneath and from the side and you could open it up and look inside the, you know, in the interior, you could lift the hood. It was like that in every place that you viewed the word. So if you looked at it from the front, you, you look at the word holy from the front, you learned this about holy, about holiness. And then if you looked at it from over here, the same exact word, there was a whole nother perspective, a whole nother, if you will, would dimension to that same word. Are you with me? And underneath, and it, it was kind of like that. This is the closest way I could explain it. it was kind of like that. And the word was, again, it was living. It was, and that's the part that's hard to explain. It was alive. The words were alive. Like they were like, it, it, the word itself was like, like a creature. It was alive. And when I, when, and then in the dream, I would breathe the word in. And like, like for instance, I, this one I remember in particular, like the word courage was alive. And when I would breathe, I would inhale. And when I would inhale in the dream, I would inhale the word courage. And when I inhaled the word courage, I suddenly became a courageous man in the dream. And then in the dream, the dream changed, and the Lord said, I'm about to unlock the vaults of heaven and open up and, and reveal my glory that has been hidden from all ages past and present, from the eons of ages, I'm about to reveal my glory 
that even the angels themselves had not had the privilege to look into. And I'm about to reveal it, listen to this, in this generation. But he said this, but if I revealed my glory in this operating system, it would destroy people, cults would come out of it, heresies would be built. And so he said, I'm giving you a new operating system so that I can reveal my glory and have it be constructive and not destructive. And I began to realize something, and that's where we're going to kind of take off, and uh, that I've shared before. Um, uh, how many of you know that the knowledge, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the water covers the sea? Now, I know the book of Daniel says, in the last days, knowledge will increase, and some theologians have assigned that to you know, the information age, and computers and the web and all, all that, and, and, and I think there's a dimension of that, but I think that that, that can, I think the information age is simply a manifestation of a third heaven epic season, in which not only does God want to Google the world, but he wants to Google heaven. He wants you to be able to Google God. It's a metaphor, of course. He wants you to be able to Google God and f- learn things. Listen, it says the, glo- the, glo- the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the water covers the sea. I know that that can mean, and it's been preached, and I don't think it's wrong, that more people will know about God than any, pl- than any time in history. Than- but I don't think that's specifically what it means. I think it means that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, like what we know about God, will cover the earth like the waters, like the depth of the sea, we will learn about the glory of God. Like what we learn about God will be like the depths of the sea and it will it'll be so vast, it'll be as deep as the sea and as broad as the earth. That's how much we're going to know about God. When, we, when God gets done revealing his glory, that's how much we'll know about God in comparison to what we know now. We're going to Google God. And God is going to expose himself. But here's what's important. Now, in the, remember that um, I said that in the, in the dream, the words were alive. How many of you know that you could destroy every Bible and every language ever written, every scroll, every, every Dead Sea scroll, every piece that will ever be dis, uh, discovered or ever has been discovered, every computer that carries a a Bible program, you could destroy all of the Word of God from the earth. You could burn it all up and you wouldn't destroy the Word of God. Because the Word of God was before the world was made. And long after the earth is gone, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will not pass away. Are you following me? So how many of you know, some people think this is the Word of God. But I want to propose to you that the Word of God is living, Hebrews 4, living and active. That this is ink on a page. That these words, in fact, let me just, I just opened any page. It's all good. Look at this. Hebrews, I mean, sorry, Ezekiel 11. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which faced the east, eastward. And, and it goes on. That, that verse right there was never meant to be memorized. It was meant to be a door into an invitation that you would breathe it in and that you would experience a piece of the kingdom that you never experienced before. When you read it as something to remember instead of something to experience, you develop a paradigm that actually blinds you to the reality of Jesus Christ. If, this, if, the, if knowing this book and knowing the Word of God were synonymous, the Pharisees would have rocked. If knowing the book was synonymous with knowing God, the Pharisees would have rocked. Now think about it. The Pharisees... They had the inside track to Jesus because Jesus preached according to uh, the Gospels. It was his custom, Jesus' custom, to preach in the synagogues. So this, the, 
the Pharisees had the inside track to Jesus, right? Now, we're not talking about Jesus just preaching. Jesus is ruining funerals. He's raising the dead. He's cleansing lepers. He's healing the sick. He's, he's changing the weather. He is making, he's, he's in, you know, he is multiplying food. And this, the stories go on and on, right? No amplification, no advertisement, no webcasts, no sound system, and Jesus would be equal to the greatest rock star in our time as far as his popularity, right? Like he can't go anywhere, people enthrong him. He can't sleep, he's got a, he gets on a boat, and he's like, we got a little piece, he gets to the other side of the lake, and they've all run across all around the lake, and they meet him there. Are you following me? And he's doing wonders and signs and miracles. So much so that when he casts out demons, when he meets a demon in a person, the demon goes, you're the Messiah. He says, shut up and don't tell anybody. So the demons are even telling the truth. Tell me about that. A demon telling the truth. Demons are telling the truth. Prostitutes know who he is. Even Peter can figure him out. But the, Phar the Pharisee, the Pharisees who memorized the book, follow me? They watch Jesus do a miracle, right? Right in front of them. A lame man walks. A leper walks. Jesus is sending them to the priest, right? Jesus is sending them in the temple. He says to the, to the, the leper, go show yourself to the priest. What's happening? They're, they're experiencing the miracles of Jesus, but they have the way that they've learn to encounter the Word of God, the Word of God is actually blinding them to the Christ who's standing in front of them. It cannot, they have read God out of the book. Are you following me? So, the Word of God is living and active, and I've shared this before, but you know, when I first came to Bethel, one of my jobs was to pick up the speakers, the conference speakers at the airport. And you know, that's, our airport's pretty small. 27 people come off a plane, and they, you know, they, and I didn't know who the speakers were, so they'd give me the brochure of the conference, and they would circle what speaker I'm picking up. So, like, you know, they'd circle Bob Jones, and I, the picture of Bob Jones, and I'd go, okay, I'll put this, put the, the brochure on the front seat, and I'd go to the airport, right? Now, how many know I don't have Bob Jones in the front seat? I got a picture of Bob Jones in the front seat. So when I see him, I can pick him up. See, a lot of people, are they got Bob Jones, picture of Bob Jones. And they think because they're driving around with a picture of Bob Jones that they have a relationship with him. How many know that the goal of the book is that you would get to know the author? If you know the book and you don't know the author, you're in deception. Well, that's a good word right there. I said that in Singapore so much, they got t-shirts made. That's a good word right there. Now, there are levels of truth. I don't know how you say this, but all truth is true. That was deep right there, wasn't it? 1 Corinthians 13, we know this well. Faith, hope, and love. Abide in these three, but the greatest of these is what? Love. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest... Did you see that, that God says faith, hope, and love, but he assigns a greater value to love. He goes, but there is an order here. The greatest is love. Remember in the dream, I said some words were small and others were large. And the Lord said, not all truth is created equal. And um, he speaks to, Jesus speaks to the um, scribes and Pharisees, 23rd chapter of Matthew. And he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the, listen to this, weightier, everybody say weightier, weightier. provisions of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Now, look at this. Jesus said, listen, you tithe, even your garden, you even, garden, you're, even your garden herbs, you've tithed. That's good. You should have done that. But you've neglected the things that are heavier, the weightier things, faithfulness, justice, and whatever else he said is good, and mercy. 
In other words, he said, tithing is true, it's important, but mercy, faithfulness, and justice are weightier. They carry more weight. Are you getting this? What I'm saying is this. God wants to, he wants to release revelation that the planet has never experienced, and he told me that the angels have never experienced. But if he, if he releases it, if he releases revelation on a, on a, on a um, operating system that says all truth is created equal, part of the reasons why cults start is because people are yelling what God's whispering. And people are whispering what God's yelling. In other words, emphasis makes a difference in truth because Jesus said some truth is weightier than others, some truth is greater than others, and when you take the truth that's greater and you put it below the truth that's lesser, you have a perversion, the wrong version. You take sexuality, and you take, how many of you know we all got here out of intercourse, out of sexuality? And by the way, that shouldn't be whispered in the church, it's in the Bible. But when you take sex and you move it out of covenant, what, the, what, what populated the earth with sons and daughters of the king, what brought sons and daughters into existence, suddenly becomes one of the worst perversions in human history. And all you, listen, you take sex, the same act, don't think about that, same act, and you move it outside of covenant. What do you have? Perversion. What's perversion? The wrong version of the right act. If you take, for instance, we just read, now faith, hope, and love abide in these three, but the greatest of these is love. How about if you take husbands love your wives, wives submit to your husbands. How about if you reverse those? And you may, how many think that, how many of you know that love is greater than submission? What happens if you put submission at the top and you say, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives? And you, you know what you do? You create a culture where you say to women, it doesn't matter what he does, you do what he tells you to do. And we have Tarzan bringing the jungle into the house. Now, listen, you got to understand, I've been married 34 years. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not talking about divorce. I'm just talking about that when, when Tarzan is beating the, the wife, you know, destroying the children and bringing all the animals into the family room, it's time for Tarzan to be exiled to the jungle until Jane and the kids can get well and Tarzan can get alive. And sometimes Tarzan's a nice guy and it's G.I. Jane who needs to get a life. <laughs> How many of you know, it's, it's just not always us, ladies. <laughs> what I'm getting at is this, is that if husbands love their wives as, as, just a little as, Christ loved the church and, lay, and gave himself up for her. Are you with me? Whether, they were, whether you're an atheist, an agnostic, whether you're a, a Muslim, a Hindu, or whatever your title is. If you loved your wife the way Christ loved the church, submission wouldn't be a cuss word. Because the natural response of laying down your life for someone like Christ loved the church is that people would gladly be a part of serving you. That's a good word right there. Worthy of a t-shirt. <laughs> what happens if you take um, friendship and fatherhood or motherhood and you reverse that? And you put friendship on the top and you put fatherhood and motherhood on the bottom. Listen, we should be friends with our kids. But how many of you know there's a difference between friendship and spoiled brats? You, you're seeing where I'm going though, right? All I'm saying to you is that is that in order for the word to be true, it has to not just be contextually right, like, you know, that's what Paul meant when he spoke it, that's the context of history, that's, it also has to be 
in its right place in the order of truth. Are you following me? And what I'm getting to is that, is that we need the Holy Spirit as the Lord begins to give us revelation, we need the Holy Spirit to, to take the building blocks of truth and put them in the right place so we don't end up with foundation stones being the roof tiles and wonder why the roof caves in. I can't tell you how many cults are developed over not wrong words, but wrong emphasis. The Mormons, uh, you know, God love them. And by the way, I think there's going to be a move of God among the Mormons. I really do. I believe that. But they took the verse where um, Paul talks about being baptized for the dead. And they made a whole, you, get, you have a whole genealogy, man. You go get online, you can pay to have your, know who your great, 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 great you know why they did that? Because they want to be baptized for their great, great, great grandfather so they can get him out of hell. What is that? Is that is it in the Bible about being baptized for the dead? Yeah, but what did they do? They created a whole doctrine out of something God whispered. He whispered it so much, he didn't even tell us what he meant. I don't know if you got that. but So it's important, Isaiah 28 says, precept upon precept, line upon line, at here, there, here little, there little. God builds precept upon precept, line upon line. There is an order to truth. There are weightier truths. There are greater truths. There are lesser truths. There are lighter truths. If you don't receive revelation in the context that God means it, you'll end up, we'll end up with some of the, the worst cults and heretics in, in history if we don't get this new operating system before we get this new revelation. <laughs> That's what I believe. Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have life. This is John 5, 39. It's those that testify about me and you're unwilling to come to me and have life. Paul said this, the, the, the word kills, but the spirit gives life. So, now, also I want to say this, the word is held in tension. All truth is held in tension. For instance, let me give you a few. You want a few? Galatians 5, verse 2, Paul, Paul says this, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ is of no benefit to you. Pretty clear, right? It's Galatians 5, 2. Acts 16, 1. Paul came to, to uh, Derby and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He's well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium, and Paul wanted this man to go with him, so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. You've got to get this. Galatians says, Paul writes, If you receive circumcision, Christ is no benefit to you. Timothy, come here. We need to circumcise you. I, I, if I was Timothy, I'd be like, uh, The book you read, I'm good to go. Matthew chapter 5, here we go. Jesus said, I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Pretty clear? Everybody agree? John 2, 14. And Jesus found some in the temple of those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and money changers seated at the tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. He poured, he poured, out, poured out their coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. What is it? Do I turn the other cheek or do I go home and get a whip and chase my neighbor out of the church? I just wonder, you think Jesus hit anybody or just tried to scare them off? Scared them off? That's what your doctrine says? <laughs> Whatever, I won't, I won't even comment on that. Let's just go on. John 18, 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting, so I'd not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. Pretty clear, right? Matthew 6, 9. 
Pray it in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which is it? Is your kingdom not of this world or is it that heaven should be on earth? What is it? Do I turn the other cheek or do I beat that guy up? Do I circumcise or do I not circumcise? Ladies, you don't even care about these, some of these points. <laughs> but some of us, these points are cutting. <laughs> How about this one, Luke twenty-two thirty-six, And Jesus said to them, but now whoever has a money belt, take it along, likewise a bag. Whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. I tell you, that which is written will be fulfilled about me. He was numbered among transgressors, for which refers to me, this which refers to me has, has to be fulfilled. And they said, look, Lord, there are two swords. And he said, good, take them, that'll be enough. John 18.10. Simon Peter, then having a sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's slave and cut off the right ear of the slave's name who was called Malchus. And Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Is it, get the sword? How come I'm supposed to have a sword if I'm not supposed to use the sword when three hours later we're attacked? <laughs> Jesus all, Peter, what are you doing? I use the sword. <laughs> I never said use the sword. I just said bring the sword. <laughs> what for? Just for looks? Yes. <laughs> I just want you to look tough so I can be numbered among transgressors. I didn't say use it. How about Ephesians 2.8? By grace you have been saved through faith. That's not of yourself. It's a gift from God, not as a result from works that no one can boast. James 2.17. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Is it works or faith? Get this one. I like this one. Acts 2.21. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 13.48. And when the Gentiles heard this preaching, they began rejoicing, glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many has been appointed to eternal life, believed. I like this one. This is one of my favorites. Matthew 24. And Jesus was sitting at the Mount of Olives with his disciples who came to him privately, saying, Tell us when all these things have hap will happen, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said, See that no one misleads you, for they shall come in my name, saying unto Christ, and mislead many, and you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Don't be frightened, for these things must take place, but it's not the end yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, in various places there shall be famine and earthquakes. When will that happen? Jesus said, This is a sign of the end of the age. Now, Isaiah chapter 2, God writes, Now it will come about in the last days. That the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as chief of the mountains, and he will be raised above the hills, and nations will stream to it. Verse 4. He will judge between nations, render decisions between many people. They will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up against uh, sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. <laughs> Which one is it? Jesus said in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars. And that there will be nation rising up against nation. But then in Isaiah he prophesied that they will, it will come to the mountain of the house of the Lord. They'll turn their pruning hooks, I'm sorry, their spears into pruning hooks and their plows into whatever they're going to do. Spears into pruning hooks and, and, ha and hammer their swords into plowshares. That's what it is. And nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war. When will that happen? Last days. When did Jesus say nation will rise up against nation? Last days. Which is it? You think I have an answer. You think I have an answer for all of these, don't you? You think, okay, he's going to tell us which it is. I don't know. You have the Holy Spirit that's supposed to teach you and guide you into all truth. If you read this book without the Holy Spirit, 
you, it will imprison you and you will be imprisoned in the prison of religion. And it is, the, it is the place where you do hard time. It's where the main criminals go. This book was meant to be understood only by people who know the Holy Spirit because it's the Word and the Spirit that be equal truth. Okay, it's going to get worse. Much of the Bible is God's documentary on man and not God's, God's commentary on life. Okay, here we go. Much of the Bible is God's documentary on man and not God's commentary on life. Sometimes it's obvious when God is showing a documentary. For example, when the bad guy does something bad. In other words, you know what a documentary is? You know what a commentary is, right? Okay. Sometimes in the Bible, when the character is bad and he does something bad, you go, that's a documentary. God's not. For instance, Judas, he, he, he betrays Jesus, right? And then he feels bad for it, and he goes and hangs himself. Right? When the bad guy in the movie does something bad, we go, God's not saying, if you sin, go hang yourself. Right? We know that. We're not saying, we know that God isn't saying, listen, one of my apostles, when he realized that he did something wrong, he went and hung himself. So that means that if I do something wrong, one of the ways I can get redemption is to go hang myself. No, we know for sure that that's, God is sharing a story about what happened. He's not saying, this is the way to redemption. Go hang yourself and I'll forgive you. It's, are you guys all right? You see what I'm getting at. I'm saying that the Bible isn't always telling you what to do. It's oftentimes God telling you what happened. And when the bad guy does something bad, it's easy to go, oh, we're not supposed to do that. God's telling us that's what happened. But what happens when the good guy does something bad? <laughs> Don't you hate movies like that? Like, I love movies where the good guy is a good guy all the way through the movie. Like, he's got the character of Jesus. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Like, what happens when the wisest man in the world loses a relationship with God? Well, when he has a relationship with God, he writes Proverbs. We all love Proverbs, right? It's, the, it's with Solomon, who's the wisest man in the world, in relationship with God, telling us how to live life. But what happens when the wisest man in the world doesn't, take his, doesn't read his own book? He runs off with women instead of what, were, what, was, what are 10% of the Proverbs about? Not giving your strength to women, not running off with horrors, right? What happens when the king who wrote the book doesn't read his own book and runs off with women and loses his relationship with God? I can tell you what happens. He writes the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes was never meant to be true. It was meant to show you what happens when a, the most gifted man in the world loses relationship with God and tries to be wise and not know God anymore. Let me give you a few of the phrases. You ready? Ecclesiastes 2.13. I saw that wisdom exceeds folly as light ex excels darkness. Good statement, right? You're like, go Solomon. Next verse. The wise man's eyes are in his head. But the fool walks in darkness. True, right? And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. <laughs> then I said to myself, as it is with the fate of the fool, so it will befall the fate of a wise man. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this is vanity. <laughs> the word vanity in this particular setting, all through the book of Ecclesiastes, look it up. It's the Hebrew word. It means it means living without any purpose. It means purposeless. Okay? Ecclesiastes 2.21. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom and knowledge and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored for them. This, too, is vanity and great evil. Now, you've got to get this. When he had a relation with God, he said in Proverbs, a righteous man gives an inheritance to what? His children's children. What does he say in Ecclesiastes? When there's a man who's labored with wisdom and knowledge and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who's not labored for it. This is vanity and evil. 
For what does a man get for all his labor and his striving, which he labors under the sun? Because all of his days and his tasks are painful and grievous. Even at night his mind doesn't rest. This too is vanity. How about Ecclesiastes 3.19? For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of the sons of beasts are the same. One dies, so the other dies. Indeed, they, are all the, they all have the same breath, and there's no advantage for a man over a beast. All is vanity. Is that true? That's evolutionist. They could take this book and use it against us. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 7.16 Do not be excessively righteous, and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? <laughs> do not be excessively wicked, and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Oh, that's great counsel, isn't it? Son, don't be excessively righteous, and don't be excessively wise. You might just ruin yourself. But don't be too wicked either. Okay, let's balance life. A little righteous, a little wicked. Ecclesiastes 10.19, men prepare a meal for enjoyment, wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. <laughs> oh, that's just a really wise verse, isn't it? Go, I'm really hurting. You know what? If you just get a lot of money, you'll be fine. But don't be excessively righteous. Stay balanced. Just a little wicked, a little righteous, you'll live a long time. And by the way, you know what? You and animals, you're all like, you're both going to die. It's all vanity. It's all vain. It's all purposeless. How many of you know Ecclesiastes is not true? Well, let me put it this way. There's a bunch of truth in there, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that's not true. How do you know which it is? You need a spirit guide. Get her done. <laughs> We're not done yet. I have to torment you a little longer. How about the book of Esther? Is it a documentary or a commentary? Oh, the book of Esther. You know what happened? The king was looking for a wife. He finds Esther. Esther steps into his life, and she saves the Jewish people. Isn't that a wonderful story? It is. It just isn't in the Bible. Because that's not the story of Esther. Actually, what the story of Esther starts like this. Verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 12. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. Then the king became very angry, and his wrath burned against her. Uh, and then it goes on like that. And then, Esther, and then verse 19. He, he, um, the king seeks counsel from his counselors. And they said, if it pleases the king, let a royal edict be issued by him, and let it be written in the laws of the Persian Medes that it, that it cannot be repealed, that Vashi may no longer come into the presence of the king, and let the king give her royal position to another one who's more worthy than she. Now, you've got to understand what's really going on here. The king had a party for all of his men. They got drunk, and he has this beautiful woman, his wife, and he wants her to dance for them. And she's like, I'm not going to a drunken brawl. I'm not going. He says, fine, you're out of there then. You can't be my wife. And then he gets lonely. And he goes, now what do I do? And they go, hey, we got this idea. It's in uh, act, uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Then the, then the counselor said to him, well, now when you turn, when, and then he says, they say, you need to find yourself a woman. Now, this is how you'll do it. You'll, you'll have all these young... Now see, we got, see, we think that Esther was in a beauty contest like, you know, American Idol or, or Miss America. No. No, that's not what happened. I understand that's what they taught you in Sunday school, but they lied to you so you wouldn't understand what really happened. <laughs> what really happened is, is that... It says this. Listen to this. Now, when they turn, each of the young women, lady comes to the king after the end of her 12 months, after the regulations for women... For the days of beautification are complete, six months for this and six months for that. Then the young woman will go into the king in this way. Anything she desires was given to her, and, and she's to take it with her uh, from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she'll go in, and in the morning she will return to the second harem, to the custody of the king's eunuch. 
who has charge of the concubines. She, uh, she would not go again into the king unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. Now, verse 16. So Esther was taken to the king in the royal palace in the tenth month, and the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she found favor and kindness uh, more than all the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Ashke. Now, you can, can you figure out what's happening here? There's only one judge in this beauty contest. And this is the way the king's judging the beautiful virgins. He's spending the night with them. I know you think it's a little like sleepover or, you know, it's a pajama party. But that's not what's happening. He's sleeping with the different virgins and, and they're up from his harem. And when the one he likes the most to have sex with, that's the one he makes queen. How many of you know that if Esther would have taken second place, you wouldn't have the book? Now, is God, is, is God saying, this is the way to find friends and influence people? <laughs> is God saying, you know, if you work at IBM and, you know, you're the secretary of the, of the CEO, and, you know, this is what you pray. You pray that, and you want to bring the kingdom in there? You pray that the CEO dumps his woman, and you move in with him. You know, get yourself all prettied up, and you can take a year for that. And you just, you know, you just begin to sleep with the, with the CEO because, because you know what, it's, it, the end justifies the means, and as long as you can bring the kingdom in there, then it's okay. And by the way, especially if your uncle Mordecai is telling you, good to go. <laughs> what I'm getting at is this. The book of Esther was not written as a commentary on how to win friends and influence people and bring the kingdom someplace. The book of Esther is a, is, is a documentary. God isn't saying, this is how to do it. This is God, God is saying, this is how it happened. He said, this is what they did, and this is what I did. I got in there in spite of what they did, and I moved into the kingdom. And I began to move. And we're like, you know what? God can't move if, you know, if someone's, you know, if our president's convictions, like if he doesn't believe this and this and this and this, then God can't move. And I was like, God says, I, watch me. God says, watch me. We're, we're like, you know, our president has the wrong conviction about, you know, whatever, homosexuality, abortion, he's a this, she's a that. You know, then we, we just like, we just like, just get God down this box and go, okay, if God's going to move, he has to move when everything's perfect. And God goes, have you ever heard of Esther? <laughs> so so I, I think like God's saying, why don't you tell Esther's story the way it happened and then see how I move and tell me what I can't do. Yeah. Tell me what I can't do. God isn't saying this is the way to do it. God's simply saying this is what happened and this is where I entered in and I changed history in spite of her. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Is the book of Acts, is the book of Acts a documentary or a commentary? Is God saying, this is how the early church behaved, that's the way I want you to behave? Or is God saying, this is how the early church behaved and this is what I did anyway? Because <laughs> I can tell you how we read it. Because we read it and we go, oh, look at this. Aha! They were prejudiced. You know, you know that they didn't feed the Hinalistic Jews because they were Hinalistic? And who was in charge of the feeding ministry at that time? Twelve apostles. And you know what happened? They didn't, and the apostles didn't go, do you notice the widows over there that are Hinalistics, they're getting really skinny? Maybe we should do something about that. No, they complained. And then they developed seven deacons to feed them. So we go, we need deacons. Look, they had deacons in the Bible. I'm like, yeah, they had deacons because the widows complained that they weren't getting fed because there was prejudice in the church. Huh, sounds like modern church. <laughs> is God saying that's okay, or is he just saying that's what happened? How about this one? I got one for you. Acts 23.1. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I've lived my life with a perfect conscience before God to this very day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to, to him, God's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. 
Do you sit and try me according to the law and in violation of the law? Strike me? And the bystander said, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, oh, I was unaware, brother, that the, he was the high priest. For it's written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. I'm like, who the heck did you think he was then? And if he wasn't high priest, was it okay to talk to him like that? Or I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. It's like, you whitewash wall? Oh, oh, he's high priest. So sorry. You know, if you weren't the high priest, I could have said you whitewash wall, but because you are the high priest, there is a verse for that. You know, some things are obviously God's uh, commentary. The book of Romans, the book of Galatians. I mean, you know, that's not God's, God's documentary. That's God's commentary. This is how I want you to live. Romans, live, live like this. All I'm saying is this. Second Corinthians says, He made us adequate as servants of the new covenant, not, the letter of, not, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 1 John 2.27, As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. That's really funny, because John teaches them for four chapters, and then says, you don't, have any, you don't need anyone to teach you, for you, because his anointing teaches you all things that are true and they're not a lie, and just as he has taught you, abide in him. So he says, listen, you don't have, need anyone to teach you, because the Holy Spirit's teaching you. But that's funny because he teaches them for four chapters. In the book, he says, you don't need anyone to teach you. And John 16, 3, I'm sorry, 16, 13, Jesus says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but what he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose it to you, what will come. What's the point? Here's the point of the whole message. Confusion. When I get done today, you will not be able to read your Bible and know what to believe. <laughs> You'll be like, commentary, documentary, Ecclesiastes, not true, true, <laughs> Esther, bad girl Esther, <laughs> Paul, good guy, bad guy. Good guy doing bad things, bad guy doing good things. David, David, King David. Lot, his righteous soul was tormented. But when, the, when they came to sodomize the angels, he gave them his daughters. Is God saying, you know what? Protect the angels with your daughters. Because righteous Lot did it. So if someone tries to attack the angels, just say, here, you can have my daughters. That's the right thing to do. If you hand down something that you work for to your children, it's evil. And you don't want to be too righteous, and you don't want to be too wicked. You need to have a balanced life. Those are all in the Bible. How, how, how do I know what to believe? You have a spirit guide. His name's Holy Spirit. And he guides you and leads you into all truth. Sometimes we take this Bible and we, when we think it's like the Bible's like the flat earth. When you go off the end, you're going to die. <laughs> I want to propose to you that the Bible was never meant to be a destination. It was meant to be an ark. A vessel that you get in, takes you into exploring the depths of God. It was never meant to reveal all the depths of God because John himself said, if the miracles that Jesus did would all have been written down, just three and a half years of God, one guy God, one guy God stuck in one body, in one place at one time God, if all the miracles that Jesus did were written down, I suppose that even the earth itself could not contain the books. That was before computers. In other words, how many of you know that God, Jesus did a lot more than what was in the book? The book is a vessel. You get in it. It carries you into the depths of the kingdom. 
It was never meant to restrict you. It was meant to carry you. Now, I understand there's people listening even by podcasts that are like, it gives them permission to be weird. Like I was, you know, laying awake and the Lord gave me another book of the Bible. I'm like, told me to write it down. I had these glasses on and the angel Maromi came and, you know, the same angel that created Mac Aroni and gave me this other book. Named Craft. And, uh, you know, you know, you know, understand I'm not talking about creating new scriptures. I'm not talking about like living a life that is opposed to the scriptures. Is everybody really clear about that? Okay, I'm just talking about the fact that all the book is in the kingdom, but not all the kingdoms in the book. But anything that's against this book is not in the kingdom. And this book is an ark to carry you into the depths of God. It was never meant to limit your relationship with God. It was meant for you to get to know the author. If you get to know the book and you don't know the author, then you are blinded by religion. And religion will take you into the prison camps of the deepest, darkest dungeons of mankind. In my opinion, this, you know, Jesus talked about evil spirits, and he said, if you cast out a spirit, seven spirits more evil than the first will come. I believe that the most wicked spirit on the planet is not pornography, it's not murder, it's not adultery, it's not any, just, any, just name any of your favorite sins <laughs> that you're against. I believe the strongest evil spirit on the planet is religion. Religion starts wars. Religion builds iron curtains between people. And religion put Jesus on the cross. And religion fought Jesus in the wilderness. It was the Bible that the devil used against Jesus in the wilderness because Satan is the spirit of religion. He takes the word of God and he takes it out of the hands of the Holy Spirit and he uses it to kill you. And when the word of God isn't in the hands of the spirit, it is not true. So the point of the message is, it has one, by the way. (laughs) The point of the message is that you need and I need to develop, (laughs) I hope there's an urgency now, to develop a deep relationship with the Holy Spirit who will himself lead you into all truth. And he has the ability to keep you out of deception while he guides you into revelation. Amen.